Welcome to the doctor's order, where motivation is on the menu one bite at a time. Today we are at the beautiful Mott 32 in Vancouver, celebrating Chinese New Year with two of my favorite Chinese surgeons. We have Dr. Fei Liang. She is the uh, director of the UBC Orthopedic Residency Program, and Dr. Pat Chin. He is the president of the Canadian Shoulder Novel Society and the new division head for the division of upper limb at the University of British Columbia. So welcome and thank you for being here and celebrating the year of the dragon. Happy New Year. Kanbei. Kanbei. Did you guys have a lot of pressure from your family to become doctors? I wouldn't say that specifically it was to be a doctor, but it was it was an it was it was an unsaid thing perhaps, yeah. You? Absolutely. I mean not my parents, but my parents like I think they they said always that you can be whatever you want to be, but I think psychologically they played like mind games because right. you know the only jobs that they could help me get in the summer were like doctor internships or you know <laughs> I like interned at like Merck. You know, like I literally did not even know that you could be have a life in the public sector, like in government, until I moved to Ottawa for my residency. <laughs> I was like way too late, right? But I mean on the flip side of my grandparents, like they weren't even subtle about it. They're like, you're gonna be a doctor. Because your grandparents are doctors too? Yes. Oh, yes. that's why. So, so you come from a lineage. That, that's that's oh my gosh. natural. Every generation, so sense, like, my grandparents are both doctors. Uh, my dad and his brother are doctors. Right, like, you right. know, when I were doctors. Like, so you just, come from a lineage. Like, so there was lots of, <laughs> lots of pressure from them. Yeah, yeah. 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 and, and there, you know, there, there definitely is something to that. And there's the, there was the Asian um, concept that, you know, you, you owe your parents something. And so the expectation is that you, you respect their wishes. Filial or, piety. Yeah, yeah. My, filial my, piety. My exactly grandpa, right. we had the exact discussion. And I really appreciate it because they were not clandestine about it. They were very open about it. And he literally just came up to me. He said, he said Adrian, everything you do in life reflects not only on you, but your parents, on us, and your entire line of ancestors. And so essentially, he didn't say this part, but essentially it's like, make us proud, right? But you know, the crazy thing is though, they were so loving, so good to me, that when they said that, I'm like, I am gonna do you proud, right? And it's crazy because I brought that whole thing, and not intentionally, right? But like now, like through all my fellowships and all that, everything, I still wanna show my old residency programs, fellowship programs, like, that I like succeeded, that I'm doing them proud. So the whole idea of filial piety and all these like very Chinese kind of ideals and philosophies like really like kind of stuck with me. Like, oh, do you guys I have that? Like were you, did you have you know a lot of pressure or anything like that or? No, I, I had no pressure. Well, yeah, my, my, my mom was a nurse. Yeah. I think she saw the, the, the pressures of medicine. And she, she always said, are you sure you want to do it? Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. And my dad was a, my dad was a chemist. Oh. So he, he he worked in Malaysia, so he was in the Rubber Institute, and he was the guy that did the... He created the aggregate with a patent for the tires. So that when I, again, just like the same thing, when I went to school, I was like, well, I'm going to be like my dad. I'm going to go into chemistry and did organic chemistry. And then I, but then I realized, like, what am I going to do with this? Uh, I'm going to be a professor? Yeah, right? yeah that's right. Professor Chin, what a different life that yeah, would yeah, be. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, no, I, I, I'm a people person. I didn't want to be, I was in the lab. I just couldn't do it. So that's why, I, then I, I said, well, I, I gotta be doing science, and that's how it all went, and then, like, my mom was worried. You're like, are you sure you wanna do this? And that, that is why now, today, I don't pressure my kids to do any of that stuff, yeah. So you mentioned earlier, you know, you did physiotherapy first, right? So then how did you end up choosing medicine and ortho? So the, te the story that I, that I tell is that, I mean, it, it, is, it is true, but it's a superficial story, is that when I was in physio, um, like before I, like when I was in, in physio school, I'd done a lot of work for sports teams. And so I already knew the sports med docs at, at UBC Allen McGavin and the physios, etc. And so as I was, as I finished physio school, I realized that I didn't want to practice as a physiotherapist and, and surreptitiously applied to medicine. I didn't have any money, so I only applied to one program. I, my parents said that I wouldn't be happy as a physiotherapist and I didn't believe them. I did it anyway, so when it came time to applying to medicine, I was broke and I couldn't very well ask them for thousands of dollars to apply all over the country. So I had $100, I applied to UBC. Wow. Very, you know, very quietly. And then I happened to get in right when I- Did your parents know you did that? 
they didn't know until after 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 I got in. Wow. So so after I got in, um, I walked up to the sports medicine docs that I knew, and I said, I want to be a sports medicine doctor just like you. And it was Rob Lloyd Smith who said, No, you don't. And he took me by my my elbow and he led me right into Bob Hawkins office cool and said you want to be an orthopedic surgeon wow. you want to be with this guy and Bob Hawkins took me under his wing and he put me he put me to work the hawk, the hawk and that was done <clears throat> but in, in reality you know when I think about it I, I let that happen and I, I fostered that like I, I wanted that to happen because I think I was still in a bit of rebellion from not you know from being pissed that my parents were right about my career path all along <laughs> Sorry. Was that unusual for you that, you know, as a woman orthopedic surgeon then, that like you had all these mentors that were like clamming over you and saying, hey, come do this, come do that? Probably, yeah. Did you ever feel that way no. or it was just normal for you? No, I didn't feel it was abnormal. That's amazing. I mean, the yeah, Hawk is an amazing. awesome, like an amazing mentor to many Great. people, right? I, so, I'm so grateful for yeah. that. He's like a, he's an institution himself, right? So it's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Oh, that's a great mentor. And so then were your parents, were your Asian parents, happy, sad, or ambivalent that you went from physio I to medicine? I think a bit weird, a bit surprised, and a bit surprised. And then there, there came the time of residency where it was, you're, you're working like a dog, right? You're working like a dog. And I remember my mom saying something to the effect of, well, why don't you just tell them that it's really hard and take a nap? I'm like, what do you mean take a nap? She's like, well, the hospital has beds all over the place. Why can't you just take a nap? <laughs> <laughs> Just exactly this. It's like, yeah, you know, you walk into a room, hey, move over. <laughs> you play with that, you know, for too long. It's my turn. It's a really funny story about that. So I did this, I did a traditional Chinese medicine elective in Guangzhou in medical school. So the, the crazy thing was at lunch, which was an hour and a half, two hours every day, because they said it was too hot to work in the middle of the day, you literally had to run around the hospital find a bed so that for the first half hour you would eat and you could take like an hour nap. So like what your mom says, she probably, there's some truth to like her experience, you know, in like China, living that. It, it was awesome. Yeah, it very so good. civilized. So civilized, right? Yeah, yeah. What about you? How did you get into ortho and what was your path, Dr. Chin? I think I was one of those guys in, in med school, you know, I, I kind of was middle of the road. I didn't want to be the smartest guy. I didn't want to be the dumbest guy. Yeah, you know, I still want, I just, so that, and then and those days, uh, well, those days, I was like, the best thing to do is to be flexible in practice. So I thought maybe I'll do family practice, do eMERGE medicine for a year, and do a sports medicine fellowship. Now I can do, you know, shift work or family clinic work or specialized work, right? So that was my plan. I planned all my, those days I just planned the electives that way. Unfortunately, well, fortunately, one of my classmates, one day we were sitting there, we were trying to figure out electives, right? And then I was just, I wasn't reading a journal. I was reading Sports Illustrated. <laughs> I flipped Sports Illustrated and they said the top 40 most influential people in sports, right? And one of them was a Canadian orthopedic surgeon, Bob Jackson. And he was the, he was the, he was the, the well, he was the father, the father of North American arthroscopy because he went to Japan, learned it from the, from Dr. Th I think it's Taguchi, who, and then brought the astro astroscope back. But those days, those days they were just looking. So I'm looking at Sports Illustrated, right? I want to be a sports medicine doc, right? <laughs> so, and then I'm sitting next to my classmates and I'm just, this is just serendipity. Like I'm looking and I'm going, hey, I, I think I'd like to go work with this guy yeah. from Toronto. Yeah. Amazing. I'm going to level right? up. Yeah. And then, then yeah. my buddy, my, 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 my classmate looks over and she goes, Oh, I know, I know his daughter. No way, that was meant to be. Right, and then so I, 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 I said, okay, well, can you do me a favor? Like, you know, make a phone call. And I, write, I wrote this guy and I said, hey, and I told him the truth. I said, hey, I, I saw you in Sports Illustrated. I think this looked cool. But then, you know, I found out that he's in Dallas. He moved to Dallas. So he invited me down to Dallas. So I spent two weeks on my orthopedic elective, two weeks, I spent it out in Dallas, hung out with the, the Cowboys doc, the Stars doc, the Mavericks doc, and I was like, wow, this is cool. But then I thought, well, I'm still gonna be a sports medicine doctor, right? 
then when I finished, he called me up to, to his office because I was about to leave, and he goes, well, same thing, what, what do you want to do? I said, I said to him, I said, well, sir, I think I'm going to go back home, and this is what I'm going to do for my elective, so this is what I'm going to do, med, family med, emerge, and sports. He goes, why? He goes, you're just going to be really good at making the diagnosis. You won't be able to fix anything. Interesting, yes. Right? You won't be able to, you can make the diagnosis, and then you're going to send them off. Why would you do that? You can fix them. So that, because I didn't think I could be a surgeon. Remember I said to you, I'm kind of middle of the line guy. I don't really like think I'm the dumbest dude, but I didn't think I was the smartest guy, right? So I was like, I can't be a surgeon. So, and then he goes, no, you can't. So that's, and then when I say, well, like, this guy's telling me I can, that's right? That's awesome. And then, and then he does that, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> kind of yeah, but that like really shows the importance of like, like a really good mentor. hundred percent. Bob Hawkins yeah. grabbing you by the elbow yeah. and Bob Jackson grabbing you and being like, yes, you can do this. Yes. And you know, I think that like a lot of medical students think that you can't be a surgeon if you're, like you said, middle of the road, you know, what, but you can, you know, and it's all about all the other things that like networking, like you did, reaching out to the right people, having the right advocates and mentors, it's so important, right? What about you? Yeah, what you uh, Yeah, I, very similar to yourself, you know, like, you know, I was a good student, not incredible, not the worst, right? And then so, same thing, I went and I, and I just, I was able to do a couple of electives, you know, the classic thing, you know, they come and they, you know, we're in eMERGE and they do a distal radius reduction and they put my hand on the patients and they're reducing and they, you just fix this patient's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's the same thing, it's like, oh, I, I can actually do something now and having those mentors say, you can do this, was awesome. And my first mentor, my first person that really advocated for me, was Mike Baumgartner, you know, tip apex distance Mike Baumgartner yeah, in yeah, Yale yeah. as my first elective. And then, I don't know, do you guys know Bill Stanish? He was a sports, oh, yeah. big sports Halifax. guy. Yeah, so those two people were really integral. My, my first two rotations, and same thing, you know, I only got those rotations because they didn't have any spots left in GenSearch. So it, again, it's kind of meant to be, right? And so they just said, yeah, you can do this. And they wrote me great reference letters, and here I am. And, and so what did your parents say about that? I came home and I, and I told them, and he was, when I came home to Vancouver, he was having a party with all of his internal medicine buddies, just, you know, they're like his crew. And I walked in, and they were like ruthless. They're just like, oh, well, here comes a stupid orthopod. You know? <laughs> here we go. <laughs> like, oh, here we go. <laughs> so let me get the hammer. You know? <laughs> but I'm in charge of the So, okay. So, Dr. Liang, Dr. Chim, Dr. Liang, you're the program director for UBC Orthopedics Residency Program, and Dr. Chin, you're the Canadian Shoulder and Elbow Society President. But basically, the question is. With such a busy clinical practice, why do you do it? You know, Doctor, you slept three hours last night because you're prepping for the program directorship. You know, you guys both don't need to do this. You have, you know, we just talked about you have really busy family lives and kids and extracurriculars. What drives you to do that? Dr. Dr. Yeah. yeah. So I think at some point in my career, I, I but maybe I speak for you. I don't know. Um, you know, I think that we, we initially go into this job to, to look after patients, and we do that. And then at some point in the career, it comes to the point of, well, what, what, is, the, what is the big picture? What do you leave behind? What do you give back? What's what do your you legacy? Give back? What's your legacy? And it, legacy, even I worry about that word because it sounds too much like, like me, about, about me and my goals. But it's about what you find meaning in, and I certainly do find meaning in looking after patients. But I also find meaning in in growing um, our profession. You know, growing like like helping people grow academically, helping people go where they want to go. And you know, we talk about mentorship and the the really important role that different people have had in my life along the way. And that impact has been great. You know, it was actually Bob Hawkins that said this, that, that, you know, looking after patients is one thing, but it's really the trainees that you meet along the way. And it's like, th those become your extended family. Those are like, you know, the, the, the generations of people that you, you've met and, and have, have become, you know, close with and have had an impact on training and they've impacted you with that training. And, so, you know, next month I'm going to a different country and I'm seeing someone that I train with like way, you know, so many years ago that, have, that uh, we're, we're coming back together. So being part of that, that web, that network of, of orthopedics and what way you want to contribute to that, that web and, you know, build your string to make that web stronger. 
And what about you? Same question. Well, when we went into medicine, when I went to medicine, I played team sports, I had individual sports, but I really enjoyed being in a team environment. And for some reason, I thought medicine would be a team environment. And of course, people still talk about it as team environment. But when I started practice as a, as a, as a clinician, I found out very quickly that it's not a team environment because our system sets us up not to be a team player. It sets up where we have limited resources. So it's not, no different than a big Asian family of 10 kids and there's only one duck. Yeah. <laughs> the guy that gets to the table first, they can eat faster, <laughs> yes. gets to eat more. And literally, that, that's not a team environment. That's the survival of the fittest, right? And to me, I've, I've learned it that way. And then I, when I watch this go, and it's never been my goal to be an individual, right? And I mean, so I, this I, is like plugging back into that community, plugging back into like, like, and I think in some ways, this is what you're talking about is that when you're in solo practice, you, you don't have your people. And so building these communities as, as you're now building this, this division is, is part of finding that people, finding people who see the world in, it, in the same way and are, are going to make each other stronger for it. I love it. But I turn that question back to you because, you know, as, as, you, as you say, you describe yourself as an early career surgeon, but right off, right into the gates, you haven't focused on just providing clinical care. I mean, this, this that you're doing is scrubbed out is quite different than, than what most people do. So what, um, what's the inspiration for that? I think the biggest thing is kind of looking up to people like yourselves. You know, I have my set of mentors too, and it's like standing on the shoulder of those giants makes you really realize that, like Pat, to your point, nobody does this alone, right? And it has to be community. And not only that, you, you really have to look out for the next generation because those are gonna be the people who are gonna take over your practice, you know, continue providing a high quality care. And so, and you know, maybe the selfish part of it is when you are able to take part in somebody's training and train others, you become friends with them. You, be, create, you do create a community, right? Then you can go to another country and visit them and, you know, share ideas and you can actually get better by having others almost like challenge you in a very friendly, like non-competitive way, you know, like when you have a fellow, you know, they're always coming with new ideas saying, why are you doing that? Or well, maybe we should we try this or like the classic, I have a great idea <laughs> yeah. and that's, you know, you have to be careful. I think the educational part of it is just something where not everyone is an awesome educator. You know, just because you're a doctor does not mean you're a business person, does not mean you're an educator, but if people have identified you or you enjoy it and you can try to get good at it, it's like anything else. If, you're, if you feel like it's a passion of yours and you dive into it, then you kind of keep doing it. If you can pinpoint one time or one like, reproducible thing that you do that that makes you feel inspired to do your job, what would, what would that be? Working with really good trainees. So I, we are fortunate at our hospital, St. Paul's, we get the fifth years to come back and they always, they always elect to come back and do their consolidation with us, which I love because it's like finishing school. You know, you've seen them from when they were first year and you, now you're seeing them, they're just about to go out in the world. You know, they have all these wonderful ideas, they become extraordinarily competent surgeons and you're just giving them that little kind of tweak here a little tweak there to hopefully get better right and then that kind of satisfaction from seeing them go from you know not knowing the approach to you know not needing your help anymore is really like it is inspiring when do you feel most inspired about your job you guys because um, you know I, I feel I personally feel like I I'm in a I'm blessed, right? I, I'm, I'm blessed in what I've, I've been able to do and been allowed to do in the last 20 years. You, are, you guys are the next wave, right? So, you guys inspire me. Uh, Dr. Chin and Dr. Liang, what advice do you have for, first of all, medical students and residents, so trainees, and then secondly, for early career attendings who want to do what you do? So A, getting into residency, and then B, getting into more leadership roles. Dr. Liang? So I think that what we talked about, this concept of mentorship is really important. Mm -hmm. Having someone that you identify with or you relate to in some way and you trust to get kind of give you a helping hand or, or advice in going where you're going. Mm -hmm. And more than that too, I think it's about emulation. And not to say that you want to be a copycat, but you really want to see people that you 
you you admire. You know, I mean, you know, Pat was was one of my my mentors when I was running. He still continues to be because there's there's some there, he's got viewpoints or he's got things that he's done that I really admire, and I I, I, I look for those things and I, and I emulate those going forward. So having someone like that, I think, is is um, is really important. One of the I'll tell you some of the worst advice I've ever heard, right? Yeah. Which is to just show up where you want to be and be a sponge and just soak it all in. Right. And I think it's much more actor process than just right. being up, showing up and being a sponge. You know, I think that, that learning is a two-way street. And it's a give and a take. You know, when you, you, know, you, 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 you give something, you get something. And not to say that it's a transactional that way, but it is, it's an active experience. And then what do you say to somebody who's early career who wants to gain more of a leadership role and you know hopefully do what you do, lead a residence program or Dr. Chin do what you do, yeah. you know, lead a Canadian Shoulder and Elbow Society or, or even a division. Hey, this is something that I'm seeing more and more of is is even at a resident stage, is people being really um, passionate about some cause or something yeah. that's really interesting. You know, I had actually one of the junior residents ask me, how do I get involved in um, in uh, being being part of the political um, being part of political issues, being part of social change or policy, you know, they really wanted to get involved in policy and I'm actually seeing that more and more, that there is a, um, there is an interest, I think, I think that the world of medicine is changing so much, there's so much more now um, that's been highlighted in the news that people really do very much see the importance of, of being an advocate or being involved in all these, these other issues. So I think when you're, when you're going through and you see things like that, you see a, a need there and you're really passionate and interested in, in it, you know, those are, the, those are the sense that you follow. Yeah, nice. That's awesome advice. Yeah. Pat, anything? Oh, I echo what Faye just said, right? Like, one of the things that I tell the students that come through, you know, is to persevere. Don't worry about failure because the key is to learn from those and then move on. So and then if you learn from those mistakes, it makes you a better leader. It makes you a better surgeon. It makes you a better person. And uh, so that's, that's for me, that's the fundamental of it all, really. You, know, I, you don't, we don't get to where we are because we're always successful. We get to where we are because we have failed. The key difference is that we've learned from those failures and then and, and move on to, to try to figure out how we can make it better, not just for ourselves, but for others. And, and that's why, you, you know, that's just good to, to persevere and then be able to want to do these things now because the world has changed so much. Yeah. It sounds like as long as you're passionate about something, like you said, you know, following your passions early and trying to get involved yeah. and don't, not letting adversity get in your way, that seemed to be a really important theme. Is that what you 100%. agree with that? 100%. Yeah. Faye, what is your horoscope for the Year of the Dragon for you? Yeah, so I'm, I'm a tiger and my horoscope says that there will be multiple sources of income for me this year. I'm waiting for that with bated <laughs> breath. With bated breath. Um, tigers may encounter some hurdles in 2024 as the energy of wood dragon can produce more competitive and unanticipated circumstances. I'll be observing and analyzing things and trying to assess myself and my objectives. I see that, I see that. Okay, I'm the year of the rooster. The rooster sign is set to become very wealthy in 2024, uh, leaving behind any financial troubles. Known for their efforts to do what's right, roosters will find success, particularly in the latter part of the year of the dragon. I'm the year of the dog, and so this is my horoscope for the year of the dragon. According to Dog Chinese Horoscope 2024, in the realm of finances, the year of the wood dragon presents both opportunities and challenges for dog natives. <laughs> It is a year that calls for careful planning, wise decision making, and disciplined approach to managing your financial resources. So none of which I am good at. I just want to thank you both for coming out. Oh, thanks for having us. This beautiful restaurant, celebrating Chinese New Year with us. So I just want to say, Happy New Year. Sending Fai Lao. Wishing you prosperity and health. Okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>